I realize it's not the usual thing for a speaker to uh, declare his age, um, but, uh, and I won't ask my, the other presenters to do so, unless they want to. Um, but I suppose, considering the topic, my age is relevant, so I'm going to put it out there at the beginning that this year I turned 60. So I am a baby boomer, and uh, I was shopping in downtown Whitehorse this summer, and I found this mug on one of the gift shops. It was on a shelf all by itself, so clearly no one wanted to buy it. It was three quarters off the price. It was, cost me about three bucks. It says 60-something, and on the other side, it says, it's great to be this age, even if I can't remember why. So I'm here to tell you why it's great to get older. As I've been exploring my own conscious eldering path, I realized that there was an intersection between my work as an environmental studies instructor and my own observations that I was getting older, and I anticipated continuing to get older and uh, older, hopefully. Um, so I'm here to share a, a inspiring and profound transformative vision of growing older. It's called uh, Conscious Eldering. Um, and Conscious Eldering is a countercultural idea. And I believe it's an idea whose time has come. Uh, and it's not just for baby boomers like myself, it's actually for everyone. So, um, I'd like to start by setting the broadest possible context for conscious eldering. Um, because I think the why, why we need conscious elders, is vitally important. So I'm going to begin by borrowing an idea from Karl Marx. Uh, Marx had something called the theory of uh, alienation, and it can be modified and applied to uh, conscious eldering. The theory of alienation describes the separation of things that naturally belong together, and the placement of antagonism between things that are properly in harmony. Now, in our world, there are a number of alienations and alienating forces. And uh, I'd like to speak about four of them that apply to conscious eldering. Now, um, I was born into a world that had been traumatized by war. Now, war is really a grand example of uh, the first alienation, the alienation uh, from each other. The second alienation is the alienation from our own selves. Now, my father was on the battlefield of World War II in Holland, and uh, he was traumatized by his war experience, of course. And so he became disconnected from his own self. And I think we all have that capacity to dissociate ourselves, our, our minds from our bodies, our thoughts from our feelings, and so on. Now, if you are disconnected from your own self, it'll be very difficult for you to be connected to your work. That's the third alienation. My father left our family when I was quite young because of his trauma, and he never did find work that was meaningful for him. He took a series of low-paying jobs that required no training. So work for him was a means of survival, not a means of self-expression. Now, the last, or the fourth alienation, is probably the most fundamental one, and that's the alienation from nature. Scientists from around the world have been telling us for some time that the health of our biosphere is being severely depleted. In this age of rapid climate change, the evidence is irrefutable that uh, the biosphere is being compromised by industrial civilization. Now, social scientists and health researchers are also telling us that in order to be fully healthy in a holistic way, mental, physical, spiritual, emotional health, we need ongoing contact with the natural world. So on the one hand, we know we need nature to be fully healthy and whole, and I believe to be fully human. On the other hand, we are destroying nature at an unprecedented rate. It seems to be a form of collective madness, really, a form of collective insanity. So if you think about it, we are bombarded day after day with information. And we can only process a tiny fraction of this at any deep level. And we have unprecedented scientific achievements, masses, massive quantities of data, and unparalleled technological capacity. And yet still, there's so much suffering in the world for humans, but also for the more than human world, all the other species that we share the planet with. So what is missing in this system? I think what is missing is wisdom. We love data because data can be generated rather quickly, but wisdom takes time. 
We need to shift the collective conversation away from almost an obsession with information and data and expand that conversation to include a consideration of wisdom. Now, where can we get the wisdom that our world desperately needs? Well, there are probably many sources. One of them was within indigenous societies and cultures. These are the cultures that are actively working to heal these alienations. And they have a very good chance of succeeding because they are already deeply rooted in the natural world, in the living earth. But there's another potential source of wisdom, and that is within a huge demographic of society that is currently entering the second half of their lives or the elder third of their lives. Now, Theodore, Theodore Rozak, one of the founders of uh, eco-psychology, um, he wrote a book in 1969 called The Making of a Counterculture. And it's essentially about the hippies and how hippies were transforming society. Well, uh, before he died in 2011, he wrote another book called The Making of an Elder Culture in uh, 2009. And what he said in that book, one of the things he said was that the idealism that was present in young people who were coming of age in the 1960s is still there now and has an opportunity to reemerge and uh, become a mature idealism and even transform into wisdom. So that's the why of conscious eldering. I'd like to shift gears now and make this more personal for all of us. Now, you may get a wake-up call somewhere in the middle of your life. It could be in your 40s or 50s or 60s. And it usually comes in the form of a major life loss of some kind. It could be a divorce, uh, a health crisis, um, children leaving home. Uh, maybe it's a disillusionment with your job or career. Maybe it's retirement. But in response to this loss, you may feel an inner stirring, uh, an inner restlessness. And you may begin to perceive the presence of these four alienations within yourself. Now, this is actually an archetypal call. It is a sacred invitation to begin a second journey through life, where most people feel at this point they're entering a period of decline, they're going over the hill. Well, you see that there's a further summit that you can climb. Now, it's difficult to hear this call and to heed this call in a youth-oriented culture. Now, there's nothing wrong with youth. I myself was a youth at one time. My son, Alexander, will be 10 in February, so he showed up quite late in my life, and I'm blessed to be surrounded by youth. And there are young elders, that will, some of whom will be speaking and performing for you today. But nonetheless, if you want to become a conscious elder and you want to be seen and heard in our noisy culture, you need to stake a claim to that elderhood. Well, it turns out in the Yukon, staking a claim is something we know how to do. Um, but in this case, there's no free entry system. Um, and the funny thing is, it turns out that with conscious eldering, the, it doesn't, it's not as much about growing older in terms of counting the years. I mean, the, the chronology of your life will take care of itself. So we focus more on growing whole as opposed to growing old. So how do we grow whole? How do we attain wisdom? How do we become conscious elders as opposed to just uh, getting old and becoming elderly? Well, in the very short time that I have, the best I can do is give you what I think are some of the qualities of a conscious elder. And from there, you can get a glimpse into the types of inner work that you could do along this path. So first of all, a conscious elder embodies their hard-earned wisdom. It is not wisdom from the neck up. There's a Tibetan Buddhist uh, teacher Sojul Rinpoche, who teaches in the West, and he said, our society promotes cleverness instead of wisdom and celebrates the most superficial, harsh, and least useful aspects of our intelligence. Well, conscious eldering is, remember, it's countercultural, and conscious eldering cultivates and promotes wisdom. A conscious elder has done the sometimes difficult inner work of healing their inner traumas and reconsolidating their personal energy that had been divided by the alienating forces of society. So they become unified in their consciousness. They become integrated. All the disparate aspects of their self have been brought home and they become integrated. And so 
they live with integrity and, and dignity. Uh, conscious, with conscious elders, what is said, what is done, what is felt, what is thought, it's all one. That is what they said about one of the most conscious of elders who has ever lived, Mahatma Gandhi. Now, um, a conscious elder will not move through this world in haste. Why? Well, not because they can't, but because it's simply not wise. Gandhi said that there's nothing to be gained in life by increasing its speed. And yet that is exactly what we've done. I don't know who sets the pace of modern life, if it's uh, governments or corporations or consumers, but I do know that the pace is fast. And I feel that conscious elders can be the designated drivers in a world that has, seems to have both feet on the accelerator, but is essentially asleep at the wheel. A conscious elder will ask uh, not only what kind of world are we leaving for our children, but what kind of children are we leaving for our world? So they will actively spend their time and energy teaching, sharing, and mentoring youth and uh, children. A conscious elder uh, has lost the fear of death. Now, in Western society, because we are so alienated from nature, we've turned death and dying into a huge problem. There's a famous filmmaker who uh, is so good at reflecting back to us our neuroses about death and dying. Now, here's some quotes. Uh, I don't want to achieve immortality through my work. I want to achieve immortality through not dying. <laughs> I don't want to live on in the hearts of my countrymen. I want to live on in my apartment <laughs> or my wall tent or my cabin. I'm not afraid of death. I just don't want to be there when it happens. <laughs> so uh, a conscious elder, because they have done some pretty deep uh, inner work, they carry within themselves a sense of completion about their lives. So that on any given day, despite the fact that they may have many more years to live, on any given day, they can truly say to themselves, it is a good day to die. Um, they have uh, aligned themselves. The fear of death goes because they have aligned themselves with deeper currents of time that our busy culture can, can, cannot possibly perceive. They have become aligned with being rather than doing. And so they have woken up from the cultural trance or dream that all of us live in. Knowing that their bodies are temporary, a conscious elder also knows that their legacy is not. A legacy is potentially sustainable. So uh, a big focus of the latter years, the later years, becomes creating a personal legacy, and that includes becoming a role model for conscious aging or, or conscious eldering. Now, a conscious elder has no interest in projecting an image uh, to the world. That is first half of life stuff. Carl Jung said, who looks outside dreams, who looks inside awakens. Now, part of the cultural dream or trance that we all live in is this need to project an image to the world, which is really a less than honest version of who we really are. And in this sense, almost all institutions in society are first half of life institutions. A conscious elder cannot project a false self or a false image because there's nothing false left inside of them. It has all become real. A conscious elder does not project anything. They simply radiate calm, wise, elder energy. And speaking of energy, uh, a conscious elder has reclaimed or recalled any personal power or energy that they had given away in their lives to any person or institution. So they become autonomous. When I think of this, I'm always reminded of these red-tailed hawks, my, my favorite bird. And I used to lie on the forest floor or in the fields around where I grew up, and I would really watch these hawks soaring in the high in the sky. I'd watch them for hours. They seem to be so autonomous. Now, the autonomy of a conscious elder is not more rampant individualism, which is a feature of Western society. It's an autonomy in the service of life. Unlike uh, mainstream culture, Conscious elders have no interest in becoming masters of the natural world. They're interest, interested in becoming masters of themselves. They're deeply connected to nature, the, the wild nature that is out there, but also their own inner wild nature because it's all one. And speaking of mastery, one of the things that conscious elders have mastered, and this is very difficult, is the art of letting go. If you want to really be free and free up your energy so you can be of service to the world, there is lots to let go of in life. <coughs> Excuse me. You may need to let go of your children. 
You may need to let go of uh, your accumulated material possessions. You may need to let go of uh, accumulated resentments and, and anger. You may, to, may need to let go of uh, a number of false selves or identities that had carried you through your life to this point. Now, the journey of conscious elderhood is, like I said, it's not just for baby boomers, it's for everyone. And it's an inner journey. But if you get the, your inner life right, your outer life will fall into place very nicely and will become a very fulfilling life of service. Now, there will be uh, many obstacles on this path of conscious eldering. And it may seem that just about everything in our distracted culture will be against you uh, waking up. So I want to close and leave you with uh, an inspirational quote from an Indian sage who lived 2,000 years ago, uh, Patanjali. He said, when you are inspired by some great purpose, some extraordinary project, such as becoming a conscious elder, all of your thoughts break their bonds. Your mind transcends limitations. Your consciousness expands in every direction. And dormant forces, faculties, and talents become alive. And you discover yourself to be a greater person by far than you ever dreamed yourself to be. So this is why the latter part of our lives can be seen as the very pinnacle, the summit of human development, not the decline that we're told it is. My father and those of his generation never had a chance to become conscious elders because this way of thinking, which is akin to indigenous ways of thinking, uh, had been lost. But now it's been found. Now, Patanjali uh, finished this inspirational thought with, with this. You find yourself in a new, great, and wonderful world. Now, if we're going to create uh, a world even more wonderful than the one we have, we're going to need conscious elders. We undertake this journey not, because, not just for ourselves, but we do it on behalf of all of life. We do it not because it's easy. It's not easy. We do it because it's the right thing to do at this time in history. It is the best use of what poet Mary Oliver has called our one wild and precious life. So I invite all of us, no matter what our age or our life circumstances, to begin this long journey into conscious elderhood and wisdom. It may be the most important journey that you'll ever take. Thank you.